Uh, I'm Tim Cartwright. Um, I realize I haven't introduced myself in previous lectures or talks or anything. So uh, I'm the director of the OSG School. I started it in 2010 and I've been running it since. And when I'm not doing this, I do a bunch of different things for OSG uh, and I often call myself the special projects manager. So let's stick with that. Uh, okay, so what we've talked about so far, um, really, at least at a technical level, is, is how to use high throughput computing on a single cluster. And um, in particular, we've often referred to the cluster, the CHTC cluster at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But regardless of what you have access to in terms of a single cluster, sometimes that's just not enough. And if you remember from my kind of intro on the, on the first day on Monday, don't let computing hold back your science, right? So, so if it's not enough, that's not good. We want, we want more. And so that's gonna be the focus of today's talk. Uh, and I'm specifically gonna be talking about compute resources and, and we'll deal with data on Friday. Okay, so this, the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about just some different ways that you can get access to compute resources. Um, and we'll sort of generalize from that then. So one easy way to get some, some resources is if you just have a, a server or maybe a small cluster in your lab or work group or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, the great thing about that is it's not your laptop, right? So you don't have to run science code on your laptop, um, get it off onto the server. And of course, with your own cluster or server, you, you control everything, it's yours. Now the downside is you have to buy and maintain that. Uh, and chances are our lab size server or cluster is just not a lot of resources. So you might be able to kind of move up if it's, a, if it's available to either a department or a campus cluster. Typically these will be offered at, at no cost or at least very low direct cost to individual researchers. The other good thing is there's often local help available at your in your department or your campus for whatever computing shared computing resources there are. Now on the downside, and this is in some ways not a downside much, um, and it's going to apply to all the options I talk from from the, talk about from now on. But this is a shared resource, so you certainly cannot expect to get access to all the resources all the time. Also. Another cluster might be running a different kind of scheduler. There are many out there, HT Condor is one. There's also Slurm, PBS, for lots of them. And it's not, I mean, I have nothing against these other schedulers. It's just that it's sort of yet another piece of technology to learn. Don't have a campus cluster. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe get together with some other people who have large computing needs and talk to your CIO or whomever at your campus. I mean, it might not be the CIO, but whoever might be interested or, or able to think about a, a shared resource for campus. And uh, we actually have an example on, this is some years ago now, um, where uh, including some participants from the, from the summer school, uh, the user school actually did help kind of organize at a campus and talk to their CIO or equivalent. And I think they actually made some progress at their campus on that front. Also, I would note that uh, the National Science Foundation for the past two, three years now has had a series of awards that they call the CC Star Awards. In particular, there's a, a section of that called the Compute Awards where um, they are awarding money to campuses to either start new clusters or, or sort of significantly add to clusters. Um, this has been an annual award. And actually, I think because of the pandemic, the way it's working in 2021 is that they have two different deadlines, uh, one of which was the spring, but the other is, is still to come in, in October sometime. So in principle, a campus could still put in a proposal yet in, in this year um, for some money to, to build out a cluster. So that's something to be aware of. Another option for resources um, might come from collaborators if you're part of a large collaboration. Sometimes a collaboration will have compute resources available to it. Uh, again, presumably at, at no or, or low direct cost to you. Often these resources will be tailored to the kinds of needs 
computing needs that the project has. And so they might be a great fit for what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, again, it's a shared resource that all of these will be. Um, it's project specific, or these resources are project specific in the sense though that you probably can't use them for other things. Um, so if you're maybe working on a collaboration for sort of part of your work, but not all of it, you probably can't use a collaboration resource for the things that don't belong there. And I think the real downside to these though, is that generally speaking, they're a little hard to come by. Uh, only, only some collaborations have the, the resources to, to have shared computing resources for everybody. So this is not something that you're gonna find in every uh, science project or collaboration. Another kind of resource is called a, a science gateway. Um, this is typically a, a web front end to some sort of compute cluster. Being a web front end, they tend to be very easy to use, right? You go fill out a form, maybe you upload a file, whatever. Uh, and typically they're offered at, at no cost or, or maybe very low cost. Usually just a registration is required. Um, that's great, but, but again, they tend to be very narrow in scope, right? They tend to give you a form, you can fill out some fields, you can run a certain application. Um, maybe it takes only certain kinds of input files and that's it, right? You're not gonna get more out of that particular gateway than what the developers of that gateway make available to you. So very limited in scope usually. If one of those happens to line up with your work though, that's awesome and, and maybe you can use that and get a lot done that way. So those are all free resources. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about commercial resources. Um, there are these things called commercial clouds. You've probably heard of them from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, so on. Um, you know, the idea here is that you don't have to own any hardware. And it feels like sort of for all intents and purposes that there's almost infinite availability out there. And not just availability, but lots of interesting hardware options, and sometimes um, like operating system options too. So for instance, they may have, uh, well, I know that, that these uh, clouds have GPUs, including some of the most up-to-date and exotic GPUs that exist out there. So if that's something you're looking for, that may be a great resource. Of course, the downside is you're now paying by the hour uh, for this compute. Now these costs are not necessarily a lot. So when I say pay by the hour, it's not like $10 an hour, it's maybe 10 cents an hour. Um, generally, storage is available in these systems. Uh, usually, the place where it costs a lot is when you try to pull data out of the system. So if yours is the kind of science where you have only a little bit of data that goes in, but you produce a lot of data, say in a simulation, and then you have to out bring all that data out, um, there can be some significant costs there. But I think those costs are, are, are sort of financial and, and obvious. There's also the cost, the human cost of just managing these resources. Uh, commercial clouds are general purpose compute systems. And so if you want a compute cluster or something specifically for your scientific work, you have to set all that up, right? You've got to get all the machines and install software on them and get them to work together, say, if you want them to do that. Um, and that can be a real challenge to, to manage. So of course, uh, there are companies that do this for you. And we call these maybe managed clouds. Um, some of them exist in the, the big cloud providers themselves like CycloCloud. Uh, and then there are other standalone ones like Globus uh, has their genomics system. So these have all the same properties as the commercial clouds, of course, because they are built on commercial clouds, but there's less for you to manage, right? So there's somebody at these companies who is doing the, at least some of the work of setting things up and making sure that they're ready to handle, you know, whatever kind of workload they support. Um, but of course that means you pay more, right? Because you're paying the cloud costs. Uh, and then on top of that, you're paying somebody to manage those cloud systems for you. And depending on the system, there may be fewer options too, right? I mean, a, a genomics cloud is, is not gonna be great for physics work, workloads, right? So it's not gonna have the software or the setup or anything like that. So it depends on which system you're using. 
So there are pros and cons here, but I, I don't think anyone should completely discount these and, and forget about commercial resources. Um, there are at times credits available on some of these different systems. In other words, people have already paid for time on them or, or the companies themselves are, are essentially donating time. So you may not have to pay for everything or, or anything, at least for short periods. Um, and increasingly, I think it's becoming acceptable to uh, put cloud costs, the actual cost of running uh, compute in cloud into grant proposals. Of course, that doesn't help you for existing grants, but you know, for future grants, you may be able to put in a request for a certain amount of cloud cost. Um, and, and sometimes even, you know, something like a thousand dollars of sort of leftover grant money um, might be helpful for just a burst of computing. You know, if you just need a few hundred machines for, you know, hundred hours or something like that, or, or, you know, a day or two, basically just to get through something for a deadline, you might have enough money sitting around to do that kind of thing. So I think it's worth remembering uh, commercial resources. Okay. So those are lots of options, but sort of what are we really after here? Um, obviously all of these are about getting lots of resources. So we want lots of things to be available. We want them to be stretchy. And, and I mean, uh, individual resources can come and go as needed. And we don't wanna have to worry about that too much. Uh, and of course we want all of this to be reliable. We wanna be able to use it when we wanna use it. As much as possible, we would like to stick to this principle of submit locally and run globally. Now, the ultimate in submit locally, of course, would be submitting from your laptop or your, your desktop, whatever you have, and then running everywhere. We're not quite there, but as I hope you're starting to see, and maybe you'll see more uh, today in the exercises, you know, submit locally might mean just one remote log in connection to your access point, and then from there you can run globally. So that's that's getting pretty close. Obviously, we want automation to take care of getting all these resources and managing them and running jobs and dealing with failures and all this kind of stuff. Again, you should be focused as much as possible on your science and your research and not, not on the computing. Uh, and free would be great. Who doesn't like free? Uh, I think it's always worth asking though, who is paying for things because somebody's paying for all this stuff and uh, it's good to know in case their funding source dries up, uh, that might mean your computing dries up. So sometimes it helps to pay attention to where the funding is coming from and um, make sure that you're supporting the people who are doing this, right? Because without them, your, your free computing isn't necessarily there. not work okay now it works okay so what we're going to talk about then is is osg's take on this which we call uh distributed high throughput computing and well let's let's actually start off with a with a little challenge um so let's say you have logins to 10 different clusters 10 different let's say campus clusters around the country Five of them run HD Condor, three run Slurm, a couple others run other things. One site has some special hardware, so it's got GPUs. A couple other sites have some servers with lots of memory. They all run Linux, but some of them are running Red Hat Linux, some of them are running CentOS, a couple Rocky, and one Ubuntu, which is actually a fairly different Linux flavor. One site only takes biology related jobs, which depending on what you're trying to do, maybe is great or maybe is not. And four of the sites limit the total, the maximum total length of your job. Uh, but of course, each of the four sites has different limits. So you wanna run 2000 jobs, go. What do you do? You kind of imagine this process, right? So I log into the first system, I look at the availability, I'm like, yeah, pretty good. I'll submit a 10th of my jobs here. So that's 200. Log into the second system, uh, availability is not quite as good. I'll submit 150 here. Third system is looking great. I'll put 400 there. Fourth system, oh, right. I got an email. That one's down today. Mental note, try again tomorrow. Fifth system, you know, and so on. And pretty soon, right, with 10 of these, 
you, you, your brain is fried, right? You're trying to figure out which jobs you still have to submit, which ones are running. Oh, wait, on system number three, it seems like everything is breaking. So I might have to move those jobs somewhere else. Ah, right, this is gonna go bad in a hurry. So we don't like manual DHTC. You might say, well, automate this. And eh, you know, maybe. Uh, automation has a way of sometimes taking on a life of its own. As, uh, this comic we love is kind of gets at that, right? So uh, you might get to a point where you're spending more time on the automation than you are on the thing that you want to get done to, in, you know, to begin with, which is your science. But, but worse than that, there's, there's actually a really fundamental flaw or, or several with this approach. Uh, and I think the core idea here is this first one, which is in this idea, you're, you are committing jobs to clusters before you know whether you can get any resources there. And you're doing that based on just looking at a, at a sort of general snapshot of availability. So things could turn out very differently than you expect, right? Somebody else may get in there just before you and, and claim all the resources that you saw or that you thought were available. And then of course, as it will happen, you know they'll run for days, so your jobs won't run. Maybe it looked like a system had availability, but your jobs don't actually match any of the resources there. So you, you've put a bunch of your jobs in one place, but they're just gonna sit there forever. Uh, and like I suggested earlier, you know, your, your jobs might work, but, or start, but, uh, but then fail. And for some reason, there's just something about your jobs and that cluster that, that don't match very well. So again, it's, it's this notion of putting your eggs into baskets, you know, before you know what's going to happen. That's, that's really the flaw here. So we, we don't want to do this. So here's the, here's what we think is, is a better approach. Get resources first. Right? And that can be due to demand or it can just be due to them being contributed because they would otherwise be idle. Now we're getting resources from all these different places. That's lovely, but we want them in one place. So we're gonna consolidate all of them into a pool, into one pool. And then we'll provide users with access points into the pool. And, and maybe more specifically, we should say, each user gets at least one access point into this pool of resources. And so again, this isn't quite submit locally, but, but at least you just have one place to go now, not 10 or not hundreds. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we do want to automate, I know I've said this before, but we do want to automate the management of all of this stuff. Okay, so that's, that's easy to say in words. Um, let's, let's see how this actually might play out or how this does play out in OSG. So here I have some compute clusters at different institutions around the country, very uh, precisely represented geographically here. Um, and you can see that some of the resources are busy. Some of them are free. Those are the, the open slots. Um, and I have it, you can see over on the left, I have a queue of 2000, my, my 2000 jobs waiting to go. Uh, but I'm at Wisconsin and all the Wisconsin resources are busy. So as they, stand right now, I am sad. But OSG comes along and starts getting resources using something called pilots. And I'll explain pilots a little bit more uh, in a few slides. But for now, just think of a pilot as being the thing that goes out and, and gets some resources from another site. Okay, so you can see I've got you know a couple at Nebraska, a few at San Diego. It turns out that means we're filling up the rest of San Diego. Uh, we get some at Chicago, some at Syracuse. Great, so now we have some resources. We're not quite there yet. So now we bring them all together into a pool. Okay, so now I have a single pool and I put all the resources in here. And if you look carefully, you can see that, you know, the, the pool of resources has some from Nebraska, some from San Diego, some from Chicago, some from Syracuse. And now look at what I have. I have a queue. And I have a pool, or sorry, a queue of jobs and a pool of resources waiting to run jobs. And so now it's just normal Condor, right? Condor can match jobs waiting to run with resources waiting to run jobs. And sure enough, it does. And so now I've got some jobs running. But let's keep in mind that these resources have been pooled together from all over the place. So in fact, now my jobs are running out on these different clusters. 
So I've got one running at Nebraska. Now notice that the second one at Nebraska um, is still idle, right? So just because a resource, this is the danger, I guess, of getting resources ahead of time. Just because a resource was, was obtained doesn't mean that all of my jobs are gonna fit there. Now, hopefully somebody else has jobs in the queue also and can use that idle resource. But I get a bunch of jobs running and they're running all over the place. I can even do some funky things here and I won't go into all of them, but here's just one example. So, and I'm picking on Syracuse because they actually do this. Uh, Syracuse has some processes that they run locally where if they have too many idle resources, they will just automatically contribute them to OSG. They don't wait for us to, to ask for resources. They just say, here, we have resources, take them. And so that's what I've represented here in the green. Uh, and then that would go into the, the list of available resources. Now, this is a, I, what I've shown here, just sort of due to the nature of slides, right, is, is a very static view of things. Um, you know, I showed essentially an empty pool and then putting pilots out there. But, but this is actually, this is happening all the time. This is happening now. This is happening tonight when you're sleeping. This is happening on the weekend. And it's always in flux, right? Jobs come and go. So Wisconsin, which looks busy right now, those jobs will finish at some point. And when they do, there'll be some idle resources. And so pilots can start running at Wisconsin and join the pool. Um, other, other places will become uh, busy. So right, Nebraska might fill up with local work. And so they might not have any resources available for a while. And so the, their resources won't be available in the pool for a while. Constantly changing. And this is, this is the stretchy, right? So resources, individual resources, maybe even whole sets of resources come and go. But the pool brings together everything that is available and makes it available to the jobs that are waiting. So a few extra words around this. Um, and these are details. And, and as I note at the bottom, everything in italics here is, is really jargon, internal jargon. And so if you don't memorize all the, the jargon, that's fine. Um, this is just to give us a sense of how things are going. So OSG pilots get resources in a few different ways. We have OSG runs a service called the factory uh, that submits pilots out to clusters. And, and pilots, it turns out, are just jobs. Um, submits pilots to clusters at sites that we know about, that, that we know will accept our stuff. And like any job submission, some of those will run, some of them won't. Uh, as I mentioned, Syracuse is an example of this. Some sites will just start pilots themselves on idle resources. And we use similar processes to get resources at HPC and uh, cloud resources. Now, here's, here's the magic. If there's any magic to all of this, this is, this is it right here. What is a pilot? A pilot is a job, just like any other job. So it can be submitted to clusters. Uh, the thing it runs is not your work. It's actually a piece of Condor itself. It's the piece of Condor that manages an execute uh, resource. And so we say that the pilot leases the resources it's given for a while. You can think of like a, a car lease or an apartment lease that can expire after a certain amount of time. Maybe we're only given 24 hours at a time on a certain cluster. Um, a pilot will actually go away or stop running uh, if it's not getting any work. If, if it's in the pool, but nobody ever matches to it and no jobs run on it, it will stop because it'll free up the resources then. Or sometimes the site will kick out the pilots, right? The site still, the cluster, the, the owner of that cluster, it's their resources. And if they decide we need these resources for something else, or we're doing maintenance now, or whatever, uh, they can just kick off the pilots. Sometimes they'll wait for a little while to let a job finish. Sometimes they'll just kill them. And that's that. Now the pilot itself, once it gets started up, it doesn't really use the resources it's given. It just kind of holds on to them. Okay. And so then it reports these to the central service and that is what forms the pool. So it says, ah, I've got, I've got this one gig of memory and, and two gigs of disk space and I've got one CPU and that's what I was given as a job. I won't use any of that, but here pool, I'm telling you that this resource is available. Find me a job that matches and I'll, and I'll run it here. 
So then an access point uh, is really just a place where users can submit jobs into a pool. And then as we've, you know, as is the ideal, right? Uh, OSG and HG Condor sort of manage and automate all of the, the details to make that work. Okay, so now it might be a little bit easier to understand what the open science pool is. So the open science pool is one OSG pool uh, and it's, it's the one that we have for all of open science, meaning it's not, it's not restricted to a certain domain, a certain kind of science, a certain kind of job. Um, it has many access points uh, for maybe different projects, different campuses and OSG Connect which participants to the school uh, have access to and, and others can apply for as well, is an access point for US-based projects. And, and that's US-based including collabor collaborators who may not be US-based. So that's, that's one way that we give access into the open science pool. Now there are other pools. OSG helps manage and, and facilitates other pools. And so these exist for different collaborations, different projects, uh, and sometimes even different campuses. So you've seen this picture or something like it before. This is just an attempt to show worldwide where there are sites contributing resources to OSG in general. Uh, most of these are, are contributing to the open science pool, but not all. And just to give some sense of scale of usage, uh, you know, here we have, Oh, this is what, five years of time? Um, each point on this graph is the number of hours delivered by the open science pool to users uh, for that month. So we almost never talk about capacity because capacity is uninteresting. It's only what people use that we care about. So you can see on average, especially on kind of the left side of the graph that you know we're doing typically maybe 10, 15 million hours that's million hours per month of, of compute delivered. What's the big blob of extra activity over on the, on the right? Well, if you look at the dates that, that kind of corresponds, especially with the early part of the pandemic, and, and sure enough, it's um, any organizations contributed a lot of extra resources uh, during the pandemic, specifically for COVID-19 research. And so we had a huge influx of, of extra work and extra resources uh, during that time. And as you can see, it's starting to kind of uh, come back to normal now, maybe a little bit higher than normal, it's hard to say yet, but uh, closer to that 10 to 15 million hours per month. Okay, so I'm gonna take a break here and get out of, I'm gonna try to take a break here. There we go. And I can now actually see the chat. Um, and also if uh, somebody wants to turn on or watch for raised hands or anything like that, um, I can take some questions now and we're about halfway through. Okay, great. So starting up again. So let's talk about using OSG. Now that we've talked about kind of the theory. So here I am halfway through my talk, slide 26. And I'm gonna tell you that making the transition from a local cluster to OSG is boring because it's just another Condor pool, right? You have the same commands. You have Condor queue, Condor status, Condor submit, Dagman, which you can learn about um, and so forth. So at some level, any given OSG pool like the open science pool is just another Condor pool. Yeah, okay, not really. And that's, that's what the rest of the talk is. Um, so for one thing, you get some bonus features you probably will get more resources from say the OS pool than you will a typical local system since we're drawing and getting resources from uh, it, on the order of a hundred different places. Um, we do have some pre-built software packages that people can use and that will be uh, in tomorrow's lecture. So come to that if you wanna hear more about software. Uh, you, get some, you get some storage on the access point this is temporary storage. You shouldn't use it as archival storage, but you do get some kind of staging space for your data uh, and come to the data lecture on Friday to learn more about that. Um, we do get some special resources like GPUs or very large memory machines. They can be a little few and far between. Um, 
and uh, school participants, that will be a topic uh, on Monday. Um, otherwise, you can look this stuff up in documentation and so forth. So if it's not all that special, except for some of these bonuses, why, why learn? Why did we spend you know, half, a, half a lecture talking about what OSG is and how it works? Well, for me, I think one of the biggest things is that uh, there's a lot more moving parts there, right? If you remember all the little pictures with the boxes and stuff like that, it takes a lot of extra stuff, uh, services and software and so forth to make that work. And so if there's more stuff, there's more ways in which things can go wrong. Now, hopefully, and we try our very best in OSG and, and with the HD Condor development to shield users from all the things that can go wrong. Uh, but the fact is we can't, we can't do that 100%. So I think having at least some awareness of what's going on out there will help when, you know, maybe you're asking for help and somebody's saying, oh, you know, it looks like your jobs got kicked off because the pilots ran out of time or something like that. You'd be like, ah, yes, I remember what a pilot is. There's also a lot more variation out there in the OS pool and most OSG pools than a typical local system. And I'll be talking through these in the next few slides, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about them now. The other thing is it's good to be aware that not all HT Condor features, and remember HT Condor is just a software tool at the end of the day, work at all or work well in OSG. So for instance, there's a really handy tool that we use here locally at Wisconsin all the time called Condor SSH to job, which does kind of what it sounds like, uh, but that doesn't work or at least work reliably in OSG. So you need to be aware of the differences. Okay, let's talk about these, these different variations and not just the variations, but how to try to deal with them. So varied hardware, there's a lot of different hardware out there. Uh, and you can land on anything unless you specify more carefully, right? So request what you need. Um, you know, the, 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 the three core attributes here are the request CPUs, request memory, and request disk. We talked about this yesterday. Um, do your best to figure out what your needs are and then, and then specify them with just a little bit of extra padding, not a lot of extra padding if you can avoid it, just a little. And yes, there are times, especially it seems like with memory where you can't predict perfectly what memory requirements you need ahead of time because it varies from one job to another, but, but do your best. There are some other more particular hardware requirements that can be specified. Uh, again, for GPUs, that's kind of a common example. Um, for those, I would say search the documentation, see if you can find something or contact us. I mean, most of these are getting into fairly advanced features and, and it's just worth contacting us. Often these extra requirements will end up in something called the requirements expression, which is particularly well-named, I think, in your submit file. Okay, so then that's hardware, then there's lots of different software variations out there. Um, software starts with the operating system. So yes, it is true that all of the systems in the, at least in the OS pool are Linux, but Linux is a, is a big varied set of operating systems. It's not just one thing. So you'll get mostly recent stuff out there, but there's still a lot of variation. This is important because operating systems, people kind of, the, the line gets blurry between operating systems and other software. So for instance, um, you know, this example I like to give is Python. Now Python will exist on most execute servers, but whether you get version two or version three is probably depends on the operating system. And so if you're counting on one or the other, and there's, there's pretty big differences between those versions of Python, and if you don't know, you may be real surprised when you land on an execute machine and it does not have Python three and your job needs Python three, for example. And this really extends to all software in general. And so I think, the good rule of thumb is never assume that your software is going to be on the execute server. And you might think, well, how do I run software? And if you're thinking that, come to tomorrow's lecture because that's, that's exactly what it's about. I won't give anything away. Um, then there's policy. And again, I, I want to remind everyone that computers are owned by people or at least by institutions. And 
somebody is generally responsible for those things and, and has a say then in how they get used. And this is typically expressed as policy. So for example, what is the longest time that any one job can run? And here we're probably talking about the pilot because that's actually the thing that the, the site owner sees. If possible, go ahead and, and you know, sort of specify again through the requirements, requirements mechanism what you need, but this doesn't always work. And in fact, this example that I picked, the maximum runtime, there's no way to specify uh, 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 you know, how long your job is going to run in hopes of landing on a, on a system that will do that for you. And that's why we say in general, try to make OSG size jobs. So here we are back at the orange table, which I think now is the third time you've seen this. So what, you know, again, what's an OSG size job? It's, it's that ideal jobs column, right? One core, not, not too short of a runtime, which isn't specified here and not too long, um, you know, reasonable RAM input, output, all that kind of stuff. Where does this table come from, right? Is this just us making stuff up? Do we just flip a coin and say, oh, 10 hours, 20 hours? No, this is, this is our experience actually working with the resources that tend to be available. Again, the contributed resources, I should say, that tend to be available in the OS pool. Uh, and it's our experience that if you have one of these, if you fit all those things in the ideal jobs column, you will probably be able to get lots of cores and they will probably run successfully almost every time. Uh, in the middle column, probably things will be fine. There may be some extra tricks that you have to do to make things work okay. And when you get into the probably not column, this is just not a great fit anymore. Um, and, and that's just how it is, right? Because these are the kinds of resources that get contributed and the sorts of hardware, software, and, and policy kinds of things that, that dictate what you can do. Okay, let's talk about some tips, more tips about using OSG. Uh, test early and test often. So especially as you're developing new jobs to be submitted and so forth, um, be sure to test stuff, especially on a small scale. It really helps when you're doing, especially when you're doing development to specify all three of the output error and log files. Um, and output and error at least should be per, should probably be per process. So they don't overwrite each other. Log files, it's up to you whether you like to have one big log file or lots of little ones, it's, it's your call. It's possible that when you fully scale up and, and are ready to do full production and you've verified that things work the way you expect that you may be able to not have all of these. Um, but certainly while you're doing development, having, having this provides extra debugging information. If you, if you control the software itself that's being run, you're certainly welcome to add more logging there. Uh, be careful, right? So if you put log statements in the very most inner tiny loop that runs all the time in your software, you could fill up the disk very quickly. So, so be strategic about your logging. Log critical things that will help you understand the behavior of your software. Well, let's pause here for a minute and just remember that what we're, what we're doing conceptually is, is kind of hard. Right, we're saying I want to run a, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to run a piece of software with inputs and arguments and all this behavior on somebody else's computer. Right, and while it's over there, I can't do anything with it. I can't see it. I can't touch it. I can't look at it. I can't ask questions about it. So this is inherently a difficult thing, um, and these are all just kind of tips and tricks for. Maybe not making it less difficult, but at least giving us a chance to, to do things well. Okay, so testing and scaling up go hand in hand. Start with one job. When you're developing a new job or new type of job to run on an OSG or any high throughput computing system, start very small. Just see if you can get one thing to work. And once it works, check, check that log file, right? And make sure that you understand as much as you can about resource usage. Right? Did you ask for too much memory, too little, too much just too little, that kind of thing. Even once you have one thing working, I think it's probably a good idea to have a small number of things as your next set of tests, right? So maybe you got lucky with that one job. Maybe that particular combination of arguments and input and, and whatever was successful, but a different set of arguments and so forth might, might break things. 
So run a small set, make sure it all works again, fix things if it doesn't. Uh, and once it's working again, double check and adjust your resource usage. And, and then Lauren did talk about this yesterday, right? Like you may have that, that software that, you know, uses a gig of memory, except in that one weird case where the memory blows up and it takes 10 gig. And you won't know that unless you run it, you know, on some different inputs. Depending on how big you're trying to scale up to, you may, you may have another intermediate stage in there, whatever makes sense, but scale up gradually, fix issues, make sure that you're pretty solid before you really go out there and run, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 jobs. Um, be kind, be very kind to your access point. Remember that generally speaking, at least, access points are shared resources. That's just a, yet another computer that you're sharing with somebody, lots of somebody's, right? The OSG, uh, the, the OSG Connect access points have hundreds of users on them. Now they won't, they won't usually have hundreds of active users at a time, might be a dozen or a couple dozen, but you're still sharing it. So don't run things that take a long time or use up a lot of resources on the access points. And hey, you have something that runs for a long time or takes up a lot of resources, that's what jobs are for. Turn that thing into a job and send it off to somebody else's computer and run it there and then bring back the results if you need to. Also, it's important with the access point to think about your, your resource needs on the access point for the whole run. Okay, so you have a job and it's gonna run and it's gonna bring back one megabyte of data. And you're like, wow, one megabyte, that's great. That totally fits in that orange table, no problem. And now you wanna run this you know, 50,000 times. Well, 50,000 times one megabyte of data turns out to be a lot of data and you may have some quota issues there all of a sudden. So once you start getting close to scaling up to that whole run, kind of just do some math and think about, you know, how much, how many total files am I gonna have? Directories, log files, output error files. Um, think about the network, how much file transfer are you gonna be doing? Uh, all this kind of stuff. And, and if you think you're in danger of, of um, causing problems for the access point, definitely contact us and, and we can help you walk through that and see if it's gonna be okay or suggest some tips for making it work okay. Uh, and finally, just as sort of a tip, I, this is maybe a class of tips, but, but don't forget about security. Um, you know, computer security is hard in general. If you're not convinced of this, just, just read the tech headlines. And it seems like, you know, every week there's some new hack, new break-in, new, new security problem out there. Um, and, and I think like many organizations, OSG tries to do its best, uh, but no system is perfect. And side note, if anyone ever tries to tell you that a computer system is perfectly secure, do not believe them. There is no such thing whatsoever. So just the usual suggestions, you know, have good passwords, have a separate password for every account that you have, which means you probably need a password manager um, or at least a notebook that you can hide really well. Don't share your account with somebody. It's very easy to get an account on OSG Connect. Um, so if that's a resource that's available to you, just have people get an account for themselves. You can, you can sort of join together in projects if you need to. Uh, don't make things like your, I mean, by default, directories and files are not readable to everybody just by you, but you certainly have the power to make them readable by everybody and, and even writable. You should, really shouldn't do that. Um, keep your files and directories to yourself. OSG and really almost all shared computing resources are just not the place for you know, sensitive, protected software and especially data. So if you're dealing with something like HIPAA data, don't use OSG. Uh, you will almost certainly violate any IRB that you have and, and absolutely HIPAA. Same thing applies to FERPA. Um, you, know, you know who you are. Uh, now that being said, some places are starting to set up private separated access controlled compute clusters that people can use for this kind of thing. I know we have one, I think we have one here at Wisconsin that's for um, HIPAA, certain kinds of HIPAA data. Um, but these resources tend to be small and local. So you have to kind of ask around for these. And I think the big thing here is, is this last one, right? Don't, don't try to work around security barriers. 
right? They're there for a reason. So we don't want you to have barriers to your computing, but the security stuff is important. So contact us, help us understand what your goals are and we'll help you find a way to meet those goals in a, in a secure way, okay? Okay, so let's move into some troubleshooting tips. Um, I know Lauren had some yesterday and honestly, these troubleshooting tips are not even all that OSG specific. These are really HD Condor troubleshooting tips. So uh, between Lauren's talk yesterday and today, you're getting a bunch of these. I don't think you can honestly get too many troubleshooting tips. So hopefully this is helpful. Some general thoughts on troubleshooting. What is troubleshooting? What is debugging? People talk about that. In the most general case, it's comparing what you think should have happened and what actually happened, right? And Either one of those things can be wrong, right? Your expectations about what should have happened may be wrong. Maybe you look it up in the manual and you're like, oh, whoops, I did the wrong thing. Or maybe what actually happened was wrong. Maybe there's a real bug or a problem. Uh, both could be wrong, which is <laughs> kind of a mess. But um, so that's what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, I sometimes hear people say, gosh, error messages are too hard to understand. So I'll just ignore them. No, please don't. I understand and I'm totally with you if they, don't always make sense. But if you look carefully, there's often hints buried in there about what's going on. So at least take some time and, and try to read and see if you can get anything out of a complex error message. Absolutely search online, you know, sometimes even copying and pasting uh, at least non-sensitive parts of error messages. Um, but think about what you find, right? You may find some post from 15 years ago by somebody who didn't really know what they were talking about offering a tip for fixing something. That might not be the best thing to follow. So you have to do a little bit of evaluation about what you find when you search for stuff. You know, what's the source? Does the person seem like they ought to know what they're talking about? And so forth and so on. Always good to have your own little personal collection of, of links and resources and so forth to help with debugging. And, and finally, ask for help. Right, we, we love it when people put some real effort into trying to debug stuff on their own, but don't get stuck, right? We're right back to the, you know, don't let computing be a barrier. So if you're just stuck and you're spinning wheels trying to figure out some technical problem, contact us, really, just do it. Uh, it does help if you can provide information up front, right? Not only the big picture of what you're trying to do, which is very important, but details of like, you know, what's your access point? What exact command did you try to run? What are the exact messages you got? You know, do you have any log files or a submit file or things like that? Details help. Okay, let's dig into some weeds though. Okay, so here's a, in the box up at the top, I ran Condor submit. It started to say that it was submitting and then I get lots of error messages and I never got the message that said, your jobs were submitted, past tense. So something didn't go right here. And again, if all of this doesn't mean anything to you, you know, the key phrase here is failed to parse, which means parsing is when a computer sort of takes apart the pieces of a file or a command and tries to understand the pieces. Um, what did I do here? I tried to submit my executable. Okay, Condor submit is a piece of software that expects as its argument a Condor submit file. And we talked a lot about that yesterday. Um, you can't just submit your executable, right? You have to describe what it is that your job is in a submit file, which names the executable. Uh, so I tried submitting a, a, a shell script in this case and Condor tried to read that and just got really confused and said, I don't know what to do with this. So that's your hint. Um, Personally, I, I always name my submit files or I put the extension .sub for submit at the end. Uh, that way I know when I'm typing Condor submit, the thing that comes after it should end in .sub. Helps me. I've done this. Everyone's done this, I feel like. Okay, here we go. I submit a submit file and now I get an error message. What I'm showing you here is actually not possible. Uh, these are three different error messages that you could get. You would only get sort of one of these at a time. Um, in all three cases, and, and by the way, I'll be showing some of this, uh, quite a bit of this stuff in the, in the demos actually. Um, but in all these cases, these all point to typos in your submit file. Um, 
And so really the fix here is to recognize what you did wrong and fix the typos. Okay, so finally I submit something. It's in the queue, so it's submitted. It's great. And I wait and I wait and it's still sitting there idle. And now I'm getting impatient. So if a job is idle for a long time, and first of all, it's very hard to decide what a long time is, um, right? It helps to maybe know that you've run other jobs like it in the past and they've taken similar amounts of time or less time or whatever. Um, certainly if something has been sitting idle for a day, you know, that seems like a very long time and you should probably investigate. But sometimes even just waiting an hour seems like a long time. So it takes some judgment here. There's a tool you can run. It's, it's a, it's a option actually to Condor Q called Better Analyze. Uh, and it will print out a lot of information. I, I've showed what five lines here. It will actually print out like a whole page full of stuff. Um, and it can be very hard to understand. Frankly, it's a bit of an art to understand better analyze output. Now, in this case though, I'm, I'm trying to show something very that's a very clear indication. So you can see in this little uh, like text table that's part of the output, the middle column says slots matched. In other words, resource slots matched. And if you see a zero for any of those rows, that's not a great sign. And in this case, you can see the condition has something to do with memory, what I requested, right? So I requested, and what did I do? I requested way too much memory. And so it's saying right now in this pool, there is no resource that has as much memory as you requested. And so as things stand right now, your job is never gonna run, which would probably explain why I've been sitting there for a long time. Now, if this is, this is where it gets complicated, right? So if this is the OS pool, large memory slots come and go. Maybe you just got unlucky. Maybe you asked for a perfectly large, but reasonable amount of memory and you just got unlucky. Um, so again, this is kind of where you have to know something about, have you been waiting long enough? Are your requests reasonable or not? If you're not sure, ask. But if you are sure, you're like, I've gotten, you know, I'm asking for 10 gig and I've definitely gotten 10, 10 gig slots before, then eh, maybe just be patient for a little longer and see if some show up. Okay, the dreaded hold. Uh, Lauren talked about this yesterday, so I'm not gonna go into a super, a lot of detail here, but basically a job goes on hold when, when HD Condor doesn't know what to do with it, uh, when there's been some sort of problem that it can't solve itself. Um, one example is right here. Um, so failed to execute, execute format error. So this is often a case of, of trying to run a job that can't be executed, where the, the, the thing that you named as the executable can't actually be run as a piece of software. Um, Here's some other examples. You can look back at this as reference. The orange stuff are the error messages, um, often very summarized. I want to I want to call out the last one though because it was interesting. You know, Lauren and I developed our slides independently. She had she had the exact mirror of this message in hers. Um, so it's a very long message. It I, I've left a lot out where the dot the th little three dots are here and there, um, but the real clues are the error reading from and then some path, some file path. Uh, and then this whole starter shadow business. And so this is jargon, this is Condor jargon. The shadow is the access point, okay? It's where you submitted your job from. The starter is the execute point, where the thing tried to run. And so that might help you understand the directionality now of where this failure is coming from. So this particular version, the one that Lauren showed was, um, not having an input file available. This one shows the opposite. This one shows that you specified in your job that you wanna transfer uh, a certain output file back to the submit point, to back to the access point. And that output file wasn't created, right? See the no such file or directory in the middle there? Okay, so that output file at the end of the job wasn't there. So either it didn't get created or you had a typo or you didn't know what name was gonna be created. I don't know, something happened, but, but that output file is not there. Uh, what do you do about holds? Again, this was covered, but basically 
if it's something that you can fix while the job is held, go ahead, fix it, and then release the held jobs. Otherwise, and it feels like this is maybe the more common scenario, uh, you know, you, you can't fix it while things are running. You're just going to have to remove the jobs and try again. That happens. Okay, everything runs and you start looking at the results and something isn't quite right. You know, maybe you got very short or zero length output files or your jobs ran instantly or almost instantly. And that just didn't, that's like wrong. That shouldn't have happened. These kinds of things suggest that something went wrong with either your app, you know, your software, the inputs, the arguments. Frankly, it's probably something you did. You didn't quite set up this memory. What we're trying to do is figure out how to run software on somebody else's computer unattended. And it's hard. We all make mistakes. Uh, and probably something happened along those lines. So here's some ideas for trying to figure out what, what went wrong. All right, I wanna talk about one more kind of issue. Uh, it's a little bit different in this case. Uh, it's got a funny jargon word that goes along with it, bad put. Where, where the put part comes from throughput. Um, and basically this means wasted computing time. So for example, if one of my jobs is running for an hour and a half somewhere and that's the server where the power goes out, right? And so Condor notices and starts running my job on another server, that's great automation for the win, but that hour and a half of compute time was wasted. I don't get any value out of that hour and a half because I had to start my job over again. This is not my fault as a user, right? This is something that happened in the Condor world. And so a lot of bad put, I wanna emphasize this, a lot of bad put comes from things that the user has no control over and that the system did wrong somewhere. Um, another case is where you remove jobs after running for a long time. Right, so if you think something is wrong with your jobs and you're pretty sure that like this run is gonna be no good, just get rid of them, you know, remove them immediately uh, so that you don't accrue more computing time uh, for stuff that's just wasted. Now, I wanna talk, the line between waste and not waste can be fuzzy, but I wanna make it very clear this next point. It is not wasted computing if you have to rerun your code because the code changed, the inputs changed, the arguments changed, you, you figured something out and you're like, ah, I, re, I ran all my stuff and I used the wrong parameter here. This is not good. I need to rerun it with the right parameter. This is, this is science, right? I mean, you make mistakes sometimes because you just don't know and that's fine. We don't, we don't worry about that. That's science. So, it can be a tricky line here. Now, the real thing here is that, okay, so first of all, I should say, you know, why is bad put bad? It's, it's bad throughput computing uh, because it uses resources that others could have used. Again, mostly it's not your fault. And at the moment, the way things are is that there really aren't any tools for you to figure out if your jobs have significant bad put. So like take that case at the top where your job got kicked off of one server because the power went out and got put on another one and it finished perfectly fine on that second one. You will never notice that unless you really, really look very carefully at your log file. We are starting to make some tools for monitoring for bad put, um, but they're, they're still in development. They're not available yet. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is if somebody contacts you from OSG and says, hey, we've noticed this, you know, we wanna understand more what's going on to see if we can fix it please help us in whatever way they ask uh, to try to help you and others reduce the amount of waste in computing in the system. But otherwise, this is not something we're expecting you to figure out and find it or detect on your own. Okay, and to wrap up with the troubleshooting stuff, you know, just some more resources. Um, I adapted a lot of this from Brian Lynn. He's one of my team members uh, from his OSG User School 2019 talk. Uh, there was a whole talk on troubleshooting there, so it should be easy to find. And I, I frankly copied a lot from there. Um, and there's stuff in the OSG Connect documentation. And of course, you can, you can always uh, write to us and we'll try to help. Okay, acknowledgements. I don't think we actually say this anywhere else. So you can acknowledge us 
if you use our stuff. So if you publish or present some results that benefited from using OSG, please acknowledge us, right? We, we have to convince the funding agencies and so forth that, that we're doing good work and that we're helping people. And this is one way that, that you can help us do that. So uh, there's a long URL here, but honestly, you can just search for online, search for acknowledging OSG and you'll, you'll land on this page. It just gives the standard kind of like, how do, you, how do you cite us in an article or something like that? And we really appreciate it if you can do that. Uh, also, if you just let us know, I should have put that on this slide. Uh, if you just let us know, like, hey, I'm publishing this paper, I put in the acknowledgements you asked for, and by the way, you know, here's the reference to the paper. We love that kind of thing. We collect those, and, and again, we can share those with the funding agencies and say, look, we're doing good stuff for science. Okay, my actual acknowledgements. Uh, again, I want to thank Brian Lynn for not only being able to steal a lot of stuff from his slides because he's given this talk in the past, um, but also his comments on, on my own slides. And then also uh, uh, Mats and Jason for um, comments on an earlier version of this. And of course, thank you NSF for making all of this possible.